In the last video, we talked about opportunistic species. Opportunistic species are those with usually very small bodies that reproduce very rapidly. Another word that we use to describe opportunistic species is R-selected. R in mathematics speak is the rate of population growth, so they are R-selected in the sense that their strategy is to maximize the rate of population growth, to make as many new offspring as possible. Because opportunistic species require few resources for each individual, they exhibit the exponential growth model, and that gives an idealized picture of unlimited population growth with no restrictions on the ability of organisms to live, grow, and reproduce. However, opportunistic species do tend to overshoot their carrying capacity, and in the real world, we do have limiting factors. So some species, the ones that tend to reproduce a little bit more slowly, have just a couple of offspring at a time, or take a longer time to reach sexual maturity, once they get close to that carrying capacity, the lack of resources starts to affect their rate of reproduction. Right? The more competition you have for resources, the less time you spend uh, making more offspring. So population growth actually starts to slow down for these species as they approach that carrying capacity. We call these species equilibrial species. Equilibrial species reach sexual maturity very slowly. They produce just a small number, of a very few number of well-cared-for offspring. They're typically much larger bodied and longer lived, and they also will live their entire lifespan, whereas a opportunistic are selected species, for example squirrels, they have pretty much the same risk of mortality throughout their entire life. In other words, a six-month-old squirrel, a one-year-old squirrel, and a two-year-old squirrel have all pretty much the same risk of dying because of predators or the environment. Whereas an equilibrial K-selected, K is math speak for the carrying capacity, so we call them K-selected because they tend to stay at a population number right around the carrying capacity. This is also why they're called equilibrial. They're in equilibrium with their environment. These K-selected equilibrial species, uh, once they get past immaturity, once they get past being a kid, typically they live their entire lifespan. So they have high mortality rates relatively uh, when they're young, but if you get past a certain age, you will probably probably make it to your full lifespan, so elephants are a good example of this. Now how can having just a very small number of offspring be a valid evolutionary strategy? Is not the point of evolution to have the most offspring? You've said that so many times, Professor. More babies equals more fitness. But there's a little bit of nuance there. It's not just the most offspring, it's the most offspring that reach an age where they themselves can reproduce. It's the most offspring that are not genetic dead ends. With opportunistic, our selected species, the mortality rate is so high that only a very tiny number of their potentially thousands of offspring actually manage to reproduce. However, with the case-selected equilibrial species, the parents only have to look after a very small number of offspring and they can spend all of their time protecting those offspring, and that increases their likelihood of reaching maturity. They can spend all of their time and resources providing food to those offspring. They can spend time teaching them to make sure that they're well prepared uh, for the outside world. The level of parental care in equilibrial species is way higher. So it's a kind of all your eggs in one basket approach as opposed to the shotgun approach of the opportunistic species. The K-selected equilibrial species tend to focus all of their efforts on a very small number of offspring, but those offspring have a substantially higher chance of surviving to reproductive maturity. So this is a quality over quantity approach. Opportunistic species focus on the quantity aspect of things. As many as possible, don't spend too much time caring for any one of them because you don't have time to partition your time between a thousand offsprings. K-selected equilibrial species concentrate all your effort into guaranteeing the success of every single one of your offspring. So elephants are a very good example of this. Elephants typically only have a couple of offspring throughout their entire lives, one at a time. The pregnancy uh, lasts a very long time. It lasts longer than human pregnancies do. And the entire herd of elephants participates in rearing that child. The entire herd will go to bat in order to defend a baby elephant from some predator uh, on their horizon. So the amount of parental care is incredibly high. And typically, if an 
elephant is born, uh, it, as long as it makes it through the first you know year of its life, it will probably reach its full uh, lifespan. So what does population growth look like for these equilibrial species? Well, in nature, sometimes populations are reduced uh, to a very tiny number. Maybe some environmental catastrophe just came through and reduced us just down to a couple of breeding members of that population. If there's only a couple of members of your population, resources will be abundant. You don't have any competition to deal with for water or space or food or any of these other kinds of things. So any species that has abundant resources, that has ideal conditions, no limiting factors on growth, will begin to exhibit an exponential growth curve, right? So for both R-selected and K-selected, for opportunistic and equilibrial species, you will see a J-shaped growth curve when the population numbers are very, very low. The difference is what happens when they start approaching that carrying capacity. Now it's limiting factors that are gonna define the carrying capacity. Limiting factors are any environmental forces that restrict population growth. So I've already named a few of them. If there's only a certain amount of food, that's going to limit the maximum number of individuals you can have in the environment. That will define your carrying capacity. If there's a limited amount of water or space or sunlight or whatever it is, that will limit how much population you can really have in that location. There's other ones as well though. So for example, if this is an area that is prone to frequent forest fires, your population size is never going to get over a certain limit because as soon as you grow higher and higher and higher, a forest fire comes through and eliminates some large portion of your population. So that could be part of a limiting factor. When equilibrial species population numbers start to approach the carrying capacity of their environment, the competition pressure acts to slow down their rate of reproduction. They have to spend more time looking for food, more time looking for water. There's fewer mates available uh, to deal with. Maybe there's too many predators in that area and that's keeping their numbers down. Whatever the reason, their population growth begins to slow down as they reach that carrying capacity. Now, when this happens, you don't get the J-shaped growth curve. Instead Instead, the curve moves in the other direction, what you end up with is an S-shaped growth curve. We call this the logistic population growth model, and this is what equilibrial species will do. You can see the effect of population limiting factors in the graph on your screen, which illustrates the growth of the population of fur seals on St. Paul Island off the coast of Alaska. For simplicity, researchers counted only the mated bulls, which uh, all have a harem of females attached to them. Before 1925, the seal population on the island remained low because of uncontrolled hunting, although it changed from year to year. After hunting was regulated, the fur seal population increased rapidly until about 1935 when it began to level off and started fluctuating around the population size of about 10,000 bull seals. At this point, a number of limiting factors, including hunting and the amount of space suitable for breeding, restricted population growth any further. The fur seal growth curve fits the logistic growth model that we just discussed, a description of idealized population growth that is slow by density dependent limiting factors as the population size increases. Now compare that with the exponential growth model that we saw in the earlier example. As you can see, the logistic growth curve shape is J-shaped at first, but gradually levels off to resemble an S. The logistic growth model predicts that population growth will slow and eventually stop as population density increases. That is the number of individuals in a given area of space. You can think about if population growth is occurring on an island, there's only so much space on that island to contain organisms. So the carrying capacity could be defined by the amount of space available. As the population size increases, the population density increases, the number of organisms in that defined area. That is, at higher population densities, the birth rate tends to decrease in equilibrial species, or possibly the death rate increases, or possibly both. Limiting factors can be thought of in two main flavors. You have the density-dependent limiting factors, and you have the density-independent limiting factors.
The difference is that density dependent limiting factors tend to become more and more restrictive as the population size increases. So if there's only a finite amount of food, for example, on this island, well, the more individuals you have, the higher the population density is, the more limiting that food is going to become. You can't go past a certain amount. So that's a density dependent factor. However, if the number of individuals on this island is mostly controlled by the fact that periodic typhoons come through and wipe out large portions of the population, well, it doesn't really matter how many individuals you had on the island at any given time time, that is a density independent factor. It doesn't matter how many individuals you had, the typhoon is still going to come around and lower your population. Frequently, as resources become scarce, organisms just don't have as many offspring. They simply choose not to focus on mating so much, and this prevents your population overshooting the carrying capacity and then having a massive population crash. Examples of density dependent factors might include a limited supply of mates, and this is why some organisms have to compete very fiercely over their mates. Limited amounts of territory, again why organisms compete very fiercely for their territory. For example, in the picture I have a field of creosote bushes, and you might notice that they're all spaced pretty evenly apart from each other. Each bush has marked out a little territory for itself. Now this makes sure that they don't have to compete with each other for sunlight or the nutrients in the soil directly around where they are. The way that they do this though is that they secrete toxins into the soil around which prevents other creosote bushes from germinating in that direct area, so these plants are fiercely competing for their own little section of territory. Accumulation of toxic wastes. The more organisms you have, the more waste it's going to produce, and organisms can end up polluting their own habitat as a result. If you have a sack of flour and it becomes infested with flower beetles, one flower beetle can live quite nicely in there. Two or three flower beetles or a dozen flower beetles can make a nice home for themselves. But as the population starts going up, the amount of waste that they're producing as they consume that flower is also going to increase and their own waste can be toxic to them, so their population death rate will increase as you have more and more uh, flower beetles, and that will keep the population at a defined limit. And then limited food and water resources is another density dependent limiting factor. There's only so much precipitation in a given area over the course of the year. All that precipitation is going to be uh, gathered together in underground uh, reservoirs or in ponds or streams and that means that there's only so much water that can go to every organism and each organism has a certain amount of water that they need to survive so you can't have an unlimited number of uh, individuals in any given area. I suppose I should say that no species is perfectly R-selected or K-selected, that is opportunistic or equilibrial. They all find themselves somewhere in between. For example, I've recently discovered that there's a family of foxes living under my shed. Until this morning, I thought there was one mother and three kits, but it turns out that there's a mother, a father, and at least nine kits in this family. Now, nine offspring is clearly more than is required to just replace the mother and the father of these two foxes, but not all of these kits are going to survive. And yet, the mother and father, having a lot of offspring, do spend a lot of time caring for them. They bring them squirrels that they've hunted. We've watched them do it. They spend time playing with them and making sure that they stay safe and keeping guard over them. So there is a mixture of these opportunistic and equilibrial, K-selected and r -selected selected traits in every population. Going back to the topic of limiting factors, in many natural populations, abiotic factors such as weather may affect population size as well, and that could happen before density dependent factors even become important. A population limiting factor whose intensity is unrelated to population density is called a density independent limiting factor. If we look at the growth curve of such a population, we should see something like exponential growth followed by rapid decline rather than the nice S-shaped curve that we see with the logistic growth model. For example, there is a kind of insect that feeds on sap called an aphid, and these and many other insects undergo virtually exponential growth in the spring and then rapidly die off when the weather turns hot and dry in the summer. A few individuals will survive, and these may allow the population growth to resume if favorable conditions ever return, 
But in some populations of insects, many mosquitoes and grasshoppers, for instance, adults are killed by freezing temperatures as well, leaving only eggs, which initiate the population growth the following year. In addition to seasonal changes, uh, disturbances such as fires and storms and habitat destruction from human activity can also affect a population size and its density doesn't actually matter for any of these factors. A forest fire roaming through the habitat is going to eliminate the majority of your population, whether there were two individuals or 100,000 individuals. Over the long term, most populations are regulated by a mixture of these factors. Some populations remain fairly stable in size and presumably close to the carrying capacity that is determined by the biotic factors such as competition and predators. Most populations for which we have long term data, however, show fluctuation in numbers. Thus, the dynamics of many populations results from complex interactions of both density dependent factors and density independent factors, such as climate and disturbances. I'll finish up this video by showing you a couple interesting examples that population ecologists have looked at over the years. Some populations of insects, birds, and mammals undergo dramatic fluctuations in density with remarkable regularity. Booms characterized by rapid exponential growth are followed by busts, during which the population falls back to a minimal level. A striking example is illustrated above, which shows an estimated population of snowshoe hare and arctic lynx, based on the number of pelts sold by trappers in northern Canada to the Hudson Bay Company over a period of nearly 100 years. Both populations rise and fall at regular intervals of roughly 10 years, but not simultaneously the graphs are somewhat offset from each other. So here, let me show you the graph. There we are. You can see here that as the population of hares increases, that shortly thereafter, the population of lynx increases. And that's because food is abundant. So food is no longer a limiting factor when the population of hares is high. So the number of lynxes starts to increase. You get that J-shaped exponential curve. However, because now there's more predators, then there's a lot of pressure on these hair, so they have more limiting factors on them, so they get a population crash here. They get a bust following that. Now, since that means that the food reserves have gone down to very small levels, that means that shortly thereafter, the population of the lynx is going to be eliminated as well, and that will fall. And they rise and fall and rise and fall, one after after the other. More hairs means more lynx, and then more lynx means fewer hairs up and down, up and down, doing this little population dance through time. This is one way in which natural populations can actually regulate their own size. And this is actually what uh, we try to do with hunting licenses. We try to mimic this sort of effect. The more abundant a certain organism is in the environment one year, the more hunting licenses we will issue. And then if their numbers become very scarce, we will issue fewer hunting licenses in order to make sure that the population doesn't get hunted to extinction or explode out of control. In an earlier video, I asked the question, is it possible to remove organisms from the environment at a rate which doesn't deplete them over time, right? Can you fish without removing the entire population of fish? A more interesting question might be, what is the maximum rate of uh, harvesting that you can do on one species? The maximum number of individuals you can pull out of the environment without damaging the overall population or driving it to extinction. This is called sustainable resource management. Some species are valuable for the production of food and other products, and if we deplete these populations, our economy suffers. But if we completely uh, stop uh, using them, well, then the economy suffers there too. So what is someone to do? If you take a look at the logistic population growth curve, you might notice that the fastest rate of population growth is about halfway up this S, at one half of the carrying capacity. If that's where population growth is the fastest, that is the level that we should harvest the population down to and never go below that. And if at that point, uh, we only pull organisms out of the environment at the rate that they can replace themselves, we will be able to pull out the maximum profit for the economy without driving any of these populations down to extinction.
Now, as always when I discuss ecology, whether or not this is something ethical to do is an entirely different conversation, but the reality is that we do pull these organisms out of the environment, and we often do it at a faster rate than they can uh, replace themselves, which is called over-harvesting, and we dealt with that in another video. So sustainable resource management is at least a better approach to this kind of exploitation.